Systems play an important role in signal processing, and in particular systems that are linear and time invariant, as we're going to look at in this lecture. Now a system maps an input signal to an output signal. We can have an input x of t that maps through some system to an output y of t, or an input x of n that maps to y of n. And examples of systems would be like electrical circuits, or a thermostat, or a automated trading program, or a digital filter. So there's lots of examples. Now certain types of systems map continuous time signals to discrete time signals. So if we're doing sampling, that takes the samples of x of t and maps it to y of n. Or if we want to convert a sampled signal back to continuous time, such as if we want to play back an mp3 file through headphones or through loudspeakers, then we would need to take the samples x of n and map them through some system to produce a continuous time output y of t. Systems are used in signal processing for two primary purposes. One is to model the effects of a physical phenomenon of some sort. The other is to implement a desired effect on data or signals that we've recorded or are collecting. So here I've illustrated the modeling of a physical phenomena where we want to describe the voice that's being transmitted by the cell phone to the cell tower. And what happens in this case is that there's a direct path to the cell tower. And in this simple illustration, we also have reflection off of this building to the cell tower. So the signal that we measure at the cell tower can be viewed as a signal that was the direct path, plus one that took a little longer to get there and had some change to its amplitude, which we'll model by this constant alpha. So tau represents the additional time delay for the reflection off the building, and alpha represents the strength of the reflection, and we'll assume that alpha is less than 1 in this particular example. So this is a system description that models what's happening physically with the signals. Now if we want to implement a desired effect, then we're going to take a signal y of t, for example, put it through some system which does some computation or manipulation to get an output signal z of t. Now what I'm going to try to do here is see if we can get rid of some of the effects of this echo in our transmission to the base station from the cell phone. So let's take z of t to be equal to y of t, what I measure at the base station, minus alpha times a delayed version of y of t. And when I multiply alpha times a delayed version of y of t and subtract it, the minus alpha x of t minus tau associated with this term is going to cancel out the alpha t minus tau term in y of t. And then if I add alpha squared y of t minus 2 tau, I'll have another, the second order term canceled, and so on. And you can see that if we do this up through alpha cubed y of t minus 3 tau, that our output z of t would be x of t minus alpha to the fourth x of t minus 4 tau. And as long as alpha is a number that's significantly less than 1, alpha to the fourth is going to be, say, much smaller, and therefore this is approximately x of t. And I could continue this process here of adding powers of alpha and various delays of y to bring this approximation down. But this is a case where I want a system that undoes or inverts the effect of the echo that was present in our physical phenomena here that we were describing. A filter is another example where we want to pass data through a filter to say get rid of high frequencies that's also implementing a desired effect. Now a linear system satisfies the principle of superposition. That is, if I take a sum of inputs to the system, I get a sum of outputs. So here I've shown x1 going into the system and giving out y1, x2 going into a system and giving out y2. Well, if this system is linear, then I can take any combination of x1 and x2 with weights a and b, and the output scales as a times y1 plus b times y2. So for example, let's suppose b is 0 and I let a be equal to 2. What we're saying is that if we double the input, then we're going to double the output. And similarly, if I have both a and b equal to 1, that would say that summing two inputs 
results in the sum of the corresponding outputs. That's a linear system. Now, a system that is time invariant, basically the characteristics of the system are not changing with time. So the system responds the same now as it does later. And in fact, if I have an input x of n and I put it in, I get an output y of n. Well, if I wait later and say delay my input by some n naught samples and I apply that to the system, then I'm going to assume that the output is also delayed. That's the property of a time invariant system. It's the same output, it's just it occurs at a later time. Of course, in the real world, there are no truly linear systems because if I scale the amplitude high enough, I'm going to cause things to saturate or burn electrically, and I'm not going to get this kind of scaling. Similarly, if I wait long enough, all systems are going to start to fail or change. My car after 20 years is not the same as it was the day I bought it. But over limited ranges, linearity and time invariance are very useful properties. Now the third property I want to mention of systems, we say a system is causal, what that means is that the output of the system is only a function of past and present inputs. It doesn't depend on future inputs. In fact, if the input to the system, in fact, if the output of the system depends on future values of the input, we say that such a system is non-causal and that requires knowledge of the future for such a system to be implemented. So any physical system is going to be a causal system. I've got two examples here. In this first one, I'm going to say that y of n is 1 half x of n plus x of n minus 1. So this says that the output at the present time depends on the present value of the input and a past value of the input. So this system is indeed causal. Now in case b, the output at time n it's the average of the input at the next time instant plus the input at the current time instant. So this system requires knowledge of the data or the input one sample ahead. And hence it's not causal. It requires knowledge of the future. Now it would seem that non-causal systems are not all that useful, but in the case where you have data that's been recorded, in some sense you do have access to future values and you can process that data at least with respect to time within the data record itself you can process it in a non-causal manner. Now there's four different ways of describing linear time invariant systems. Actually there's more but these are the four that are most commonly used and most useful for signal processing. There's a difference equation description, there's the impulse response, the frequency response, and then something we're going to call the system function or the transfer function, which primarily we're going to look at in terms of poles and zeros. Now why have four different descriptions? Well, because each of these has a different attribute that's useful in either implementing systems or modeling them and developing insight or understanding as to how the system behaves. So I've given a little star chart here to the properties of these different descriptions with respect to their usefulness for computation and their usefulness for providing intuition about the nature of the system. So the difference equation is the king of computation for linear time invariant systems. And so that's extremely useful from a computational standpoint. It doesn't provide all that much intuition, at least relative to some of the other descriptions. Impulse response is about in the middle. It's sometimes used for computation and it also provides certain aspects of intuition. Whereas the frequency response of a system is rarely used for computation but provides us a lot of insight into the behavior of the system and how the system acts on data. And similarly for the system function or the poles and zeros, relatively little value in terms of computing things but provides a lot of intuition. So we're going to look at these four descriptions in detail in subsequent lectures, but for now we can just give examples of, that are relevant to each. For the difference equation, we're going to describe the present output, y of n, as a weighted combination of past outputs plus a weighted combination of past inputs. And so a k's and the b sub l's are the coefficients 
that determine the properties of this system in addition to the order n and the number of past inputs that are used at any given time at capital M. So this particular expression, the difference equation, describes a functional form relating the input to the output. The other three do not describe necessarily functional forms, but capture various attributes of the system. For example, the impulse response says, how does the system respond when we apply an impulse as an input? So if delta of n is the input, we get a response, h of n. And this response, h of n, can be used to determine the output of the system for an arbitrary input because the system is linear and time invariant. Frequency response uses a different sort of input. It applies a complex sinusoid as the input to the system. And one of the properties of the frequency response for a linear time invariant system is that if I put a sinusoid of a certain frequency in, then I will get a sinusoid of the same frequency at the output with the amplitude and phase modified by the frequency response of the system. So when we think about frequency response, we're characterizing the system in terms of its behavior on sinusoids of different frequencies, and that fits naturally in with Fourier analysis. Now the system function, or the poles and zeros of the system, are obtained by considering a slightly more general input than a complex sinusoid. It's just some complex number z raised to the nth power. And it turns out that if I put such an input into a linear time invariant system, the output is also the same complex number z raised to the nth power, but modified by the system function h of z. So this could change the amplitude and phase. And this may be the most abstract of these four descriptions, but nevertheless, it also provides some very useful insight.